for being here. Uh, this is part of the colloquium series at the Computation Science Research Center. I have the pleasure to introduce a person that I know for quite a while, so Marty Candis. Uh, Marty happened to be one of our own. He started from the MS in physics, so he did his MS in physics with a colleague of ours that was there at the time, uh, Michael Bromley. Um, then uh, he was having so much fun, I think, Marty, that decided to continue with some of these things towards the PhD. And with the PhD, um, Michael and Marty approached me, so I got also involved in the project. So it was basically a two advisor kind of business with Marty and his uh, thesis. We were looking at uh, post and condensation, and Marty was uh, uh, kind of our expert on very heavy computations, and eventually uh, Michael Bromley left San Diego State, so I was left to supervise Murray, and Murray defended his thesis in 2015, I think. Uh, since then, he has joined the Supercomputer Center at uh, UCSD, and um, he is no stranger to high-performance computing, and since he left uh, Computational Science Research Center PhD, I think he has been applying some of the stuff that he learned and, uh, and that he likes on, on this HPC. In particular, uh, he's gonna talk about a project that has been ongoing for a few years already uh, on the back burner. And it has to do with, um, on, in general terms, uh, angular momentum on, on BECs and how do you uh, transfer angular momentum when you have a BEC in a rotating frame and, things of that sort and, and gyroscopes. So uh, that involves uh, heavy computations because we're talking about a three-dimensional system and, and Marty has been using uh, um, special methods and high uh, computational uh, resources to solve this. So um, I don't know exactly what he's gonna be talking about, but, um, but uh, I'm actually involved in it, but I don't know which parts you're gonna be centering more. I don't know if you're gonna be doing a little bit of the physics, but I hope that you're gonna also do a little bit of, of the merits and all, and all that. So uh, without further ado, um, Mari, thanks for taking the time to, to join us. Uh, the floor is yours. All right, great. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Hope everybody's doing well. Let me just go ahead and uh, share my screen here and start up the slides. So if uh, my volume is uh, too low, just let me know and I'll try to amp up the, uh, um, the, uh, the mic here. I'm, I don't have a, uh, earbuds or anything like that. So I'm just using the, the laptop mic. Um, how do I move this out of the way? Okay. Wow. Well. Going. Oh, where's the full screen? There we go. Oh, presentation. Okay, so yeah, um, thanks again for coming. Um, so yeah, as Rick said, I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about um, this sort of side project from my PhD. I'm still working on. It was it was part of the the, the dissertation, but it was really like one of the newer systems that we started looking at at the end uh, of my research, um, but we've sort of continued on uh, uh, for a while, the last few years, sort of plugging away at it, and I'll sort of tell you where the status is. And this is really only the second time I've presented this material um, publicly. I gave a talk back in the fall about some of the, the new visualizations that were done last year and some of the new work that needed to be done before um, sort of carrying uh, the, uh, the project forward. Um, before I jump into um, sort of talking about the project, uh, I probably have too many slides, there might be some parts I skip over as well. Um, I did want to say a little bit about um, um, uh, the San Diego Supercomputer Center for the students and also for any of the faculty and staff who, you know, to just tell you a little bit about some of the resources that we have that might be um, uh, useful for you and some of the systems if you're doing HPC work and even if you're not doing HPC work. So I just want to give a quick uh, plug before I jump into the research here. So um, SDSC is an organized research unit of um, uh, UCSD. Um, it was founded back in 1985, sort of a joint project between NSF, UCSD, and uh, General Atomics at the time. We have currently, I think, about 300 staff, faculty, grad students, undergrads, um, working. It's sort of structured basically, in, there's some core groups 
such as mine, uh, sort of the, the, the groups I work with, the HPC user services group, HPC systems group that runs sort of some of the infrastructure that we um, support at the center for all researchers there. Um, but there's a lot of like individual research groups like the Institute for Neural Computation, the Protein Data Bank, uh, the Center for Applied Internet Data Analysis. So there's a bunch of like uh, different research groups. Everybody is basically on soft money. So it's all sort of grant um, grant run, except for some of the core IT services we provide. We have two data centers that uh, have total about 19,000 square feet of floor space and 13 megawatts of capacity. Um, what my group does is essentially we, we run the supercomputers, the NSF funded supercomputers at um, SDSC. Uh, we run them in conjunction with the systems group or sort of the hardware engineers who actually have to go in and sort of, you know, fix any broken um, uh, hardware that's, that's on the floor. Um, so this is Comet and this is the system we currently run for the NSF. It's in its last year of life uh, um, of funding with NSF, but this is the system I work on day to day. So any of the students or any of the faculty have allocations on the system. You know, when you send in a, a, a question, uh, essentially, uh, the, the question goes to, to the team that I work on, essentially, right? So I, I tell my mom, it's like, we're the uh, customer service for the PhDs, essentially, on the system. So any, any problems you have, we try to help you solve them. And we work with the system engineers if it's something on the, uh, the hardware itself. Um, and so if you're not familiar with um, the NSF uh, supercomputing network um, exceed, this is um, uh, how you would actually get time. You essentially have to apply for time on these systems. Um, when I was at uh, SDSC or SDSU, I didn't actually really know about exceed. So it would have been more helpful to know that earlier on. So I just want to put a plug out there. If you need more um, compute resources than you can find locally or through your advisors and um, you know bring this and bring this uh, bring this up and check out uh, how to apply for, for time on these systems. Um, we also have a new system coming online in the fall uh, which is expansive sort of sort of Comet 2 if you look at the, the architecture and stuff the one difference it'll be um, AMD uh, chips um, so you can actually apply now through exceed for time on the system starting October 1st so if we're we're building a supercomputer during a pandemic and there's definitely a um, supply chain issue still. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting experience and doing it all remotely. Um, and uh, actually last week we found out we got funded um, by NSF for this specialized machine that we're going to, um, it's actually specialized hardware specific for um, AI and machine learning um, problems. Um, it's not going to really be publicly available for Fuse. The first couple of years, it's um, sort of uh, special access to uh, close collaborators. Um, I'm not sure exactly if there's going to be any opportunities to open that up for anybody who might have an interesting uh, AI or machine learning um, project right now, but um, something to keep in mind if you hear about it um, coming online next year. Um, and for those people who are not um, traditional HPC folks, but might need a lot of like single core jobs or a few core jobs, um, this is a, the group I worked with um, prior to the HPC user services group. It's called the Open Science Grid, if you're not familiar with it. Um, essentially, they uh, run grid computing resources for the um, Large Hadron Collider experiment um, analysis. And essentially, the Open Science Grid sort of drafts on the um, all that compute resources when 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 there's spare capacity available it'll run your science jobs for you um, and it's essentially free it's it's not as uh, steep a climb as getting onto some of the uh, exceed resources where you basically have to submit a full nsf um, uh, abstract or uh, proposal um, so in addition to working on all these like hardware um, and you know getting to play on all the supercomputers there's a lot of opportunities at SDSC that I get to um, work on sort of side projects and use my um, CSRC sort of applied math computational skills uh, and this is one that I've been working on with some high school students for the last few years um, we're doing some machine simple machine learning uh, models on sort of the um, the, the, the ticket issues, the ticket tracking system that we use to answer all the questions that come in from the users. And so we've been sort of having them label the data and sort of implement some of these simple algorithms so we can sort of provide sort of a dynamic, frequently asked question and answer um, system. So it's been kind of fun. And then there's also like, uh, you know, uh, I did a lot of dynamical systems back in the day uh, at CSRC. 
and you know use that to model some sort of uh, cloud computing systems that we were thinking about a few years ago. So it, it, there's a lot of uh, cool opportunities um, and it's, it's, it's a unique place to work. So it's, it's definitely um, pretty cool. So definitely uh, if, you're, if you're ever interested to come out to get a tour, maybe once um, uh, the pandemic is over, um, we, we had a few students a few years ago at CSRC come out um, and give a tour and, you know, just, just chat and stuff. So about what, what SDSC is and you know, what, what's going on there. So, um, but yeah, so coming back to today, um, I want to talk about, like I said, one of these systems that I studied um, in my dissertation, and in particular, this uh, Compton generator system, which uh, is all about, um, or, or essentially, my dissertation was all about looking at quantum systems and rotating reference frames. And this one is a system that is, can be used to measure absolute rotations. And I kind of want to just motivate um, from a few slides and sort of um, sort of the philosophy of how, what to think about absolute rotation means because there's in my opinion it's not really um, clear exactly what um, how to interpret some of these um, things are but um, just kind of want to motivate it so I just wanted to give some definitions for those people who aren't um, particularly um, maybe uh, as uh, familiar with rotating reference frames as I am. Um, so absolute rotation. So this is basically, um, you know, what you would think it is. It's, 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 it's a the rotation that you can sense independent of any external reference. So here we're standing away from this merry-go-round. The question is, can you tell that that's rotating from this picture? Um, you know, you might say, well, of course not. It's not rotating. It, does you know it's, you you'd expect the picture to be a little blurred um, if it was rotating, but then you have to ask, okay, well, it depends on what the shutter speed of the camera is. You know, if it's really fast, maybe it is rotating, and you just didn't see the change in the rotation of the merry-go-round um, uh, in that frame. Essentially, you know, there wasn't any sort of blurring effect. Um, you know, for example, is this absolute rotation? You know, so if you're actually on the merry-go-round, this looks like the merry-go-round's probably um, rotating, right? So you're probably on that merry-go-round and you're feeling that sort of rotational force that you feel when you're on a merry-go-round. Um, but, um, you know, the, one of the fundamental questions is, how do you know that that external scene isn't the one rotating? Well, yeah, common sense says that, yeah, you're, you're the one who's rotating, but in the sort of deeper level of physics sense, it's, you know, if you could rotate the external reference around you, uh, external scene around the merry-go-round, um, would you be able to tell the difference from the physics that you can measure in, in, in from, from your perspective? Okay. And this really comes back to, uh, um, Isaac Newton, who actually first started, started thinking about this problem. And the, the, the fundamental problem is this, you take a bucket of water that's sort of hanging on a well, so it's attached to a string or a, a rope hanging over the well. If you take that bucket at rest and you twist the, um, the, the rope up so that you, know, you build some sort of rotational tension in that rope, once you let it go, the bucket will start rotating. And so what happens when that begins rotating, right? With the water in the bucket. And this was Newton's bucket argument, essentially. So when the, rock, when the bucket's at rest and you haven't twisted up um, the rope yet, right? This, the surface of the water is flat. There's no rotation in the water. There's no rotation in the bucket. Once you twist everything up and then you let the bucket go, the bucket will start rotating, then eventually the water will start rotating, and you'll see this curved surface of the water in the bucket at um, you know, some point when both the, essentially the, the bucket and the water are rotating at the same rate. However, remember we're attached to this rope hanging over the well, and so what's gonna happen is it'll twist up the other way as the bucket um, starts, the bucket itself will stop rotating, start slowing down, and then eventually stop rotating. But you'll see that for some amount of time, the water is still rotating and the surface of the water is still curved. And so Newton basically was arguing that the water isn't rotating with respect to the bucket. What is it rotating with respect to? 
his answer was absolute space. Now, what is absolute, absolute space? I mean, that's a whole nother topic. I don't, I mean, this is, it's basically, you know, it's rotating with, there, there's, there's a sense that there is an absolute thing called rotation, absolute rotation, and it doesn't matter. There's not a relative rotation. It's, it's just, it's rotating with respect to space. Um, a few hundred years later, um, you might have heard of Mach's principle, um, and this sort of took um, a, a crack at sort of Newton's idea, and he said essentially that, well, it's actually rotating with respect to the matter in the universe, and somehow that's affecting um, the rotation of the water in the bucket. There's actually a link here you can look at later. Uh, there's a nice little YouTube explanation of sort of all this sort of philosophical talk about, about this problem um, that I think is kind of nice. So if, if you're interested in that, you can come back to the later. It's about seven or eight minutes, but I, so I won't show it here. Um, so this Mach's principle, um, if you're familiar with it, or you can read up on it a bit, um, it really inspired Einstein as well. Um, when he was thinking about rotation when, in terms of general relativity. And I don't expect you know, anyone to really understand what local geodesics are, but essentially it's sort of a combination, I would say, of both Mach's principle and um, Newton's argument in, in the sense that in, in this case, you know, the, you know, you'll both, he was, he's just, both, both Newton and Mach were kind of right in, in terms of Einstein, I would say that, you know, the rotation is with respect to matter uh, um, and the matter does expect spa space around it. So um, there's, um, um, you can actually do a, um, a simple calculation of if you took like a shell of matter and you rotated it around. So you sort of have a far off shell of matter rotating around say a, a pendulum. It, you can calculate in general relativity that that's going to affect the rate of its um, sort of swinging essentially and how it rotates around say a, a, fixed, a fixed point. Um, so in some sense it confirms Mach's idea that the matter distribution around an object will um, uh, determine its rotational characteristics but it's not quite complete um, and there's one big um, sort of counter example that is, um, was by, by Godel and um, essentially, he, he showed that, well, if you, um, if you take general relativity seriously, well, I invented this universe that complies with all aspects of general relativity. It's a, a rotating universe. And the question then becomes, OK, if you can invent a rotating universe and it's physically, theoretically possible, what was the universe rotating with respect to? Um, <laughs> So th there's, there's a lot of like, things to think about here that you can go down many rabbit holes. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we're not going to do that. I just kind of want to motivate some of the ideas that why, you know, you'll see that this, um, you know, system that we're looking at, it's very niche little system that doesn't really, uh, okay, what's the practical application here long term? Uh, I don't really know myself, but it's looking at rotations um, due to um, these kinds of, you know, how these ideas manifest themselves now in, in quantum mechanics, and is that going to be relevant eventually? Um, and I guess I would say yes. So, um, so this is the, the the problem. I mean, it's basically a rehash here of the uh, the abstract. But if you didn't read it, I'll sort of walk you through it. Um, so this is Arthur Compton. He was um, sort of famous physicist, more for I think X-ray um, um, studies with. Uh, x-ray excitations and in matter and things like that but when he was an undergraduate he actually came up with this little um, tabletop experiment that essentially allowed him to measure the rotation rate of the earth without any external reference so this is he was measuring the sort of absolute rotation of the earth just by looking at this device sitting on the surface of the earth and the experiment what it was is this large ring of glass tubing filled with oil and water droplets mounted on this um, pivot point, or this, um, uh, this axis that he could rotate the, um, the, the ring about um, with respect to the surface of the earth. And so essentially what would happen is he would 
let the water come to rest in the ring and then rotate the ring 180 degrees about a certain axis. And depending on where this is pointing north or south, east or west, um, and, and you have to basically point it east or west, the, um, after you flip the ring 180 degrees, um, the result of the experiment was that a velocity was created in um, in within the tube within in in the water, and he measured the velocity of the fluid in uh, in the ring, looking at the oil droplets moving past the microscope, essentially that he had mounted on on the system. And you can do this calculation. Um, essentially, most textbooks say that it's due to the Coriolis effect uh, on the Earth. And yes, this is correct. Um, in what you, uh, in one sense, you you can calculate that it basically depends on the radius of the the velocity you observe. It depends on the radius of the ring, uh, the rotation rate of the Earth, or whatever rotating system you're on. And then, in the case of the Earth, on the um, the, the 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 longitude or, or sorry the, uh, the the latitude of the experiment on the earth. Um, so yeah, I mean, one thing that um, a part of this work I've kind of convinced myself is, I mean, you, the Coriolis effect is, yes, kind of the simpler way to calculate it, but if you calculate it in a different reference frame, it can actually be due to um, another force I'll mention, the, the Euler force. It just kind of depends on um, your, your perspective. But um, so the, the, the motivation for this was, oh, that's kind of like an interesting um, system. And we're looking at, we've been looking at um, sort of quantum systems, single particles and Bose-Einstein condensates and rings for years. Um, uh, me and Rick and uh, our collaborator, uh, Michael Bromley. And so this was kind of just a textbook problem we saw and be, oh, it'd be kind of cool one day if we could, you know, calc if we can sort of simulate that system and see, you know, if, if that, what it does in the quantum case, right? Because in, in, in quantum mechanics, essentially at some limit, the quantum case has to um, correspond to the uh, classical case. So in the case of Compton's classical Compton generator, right, with the water and the oil droplets, you know, at some point that equation that he derived for that should hold for the quantum case. Now where that limit is, is kind of what we're exploring um, because uh, we haven't quite figured out how to reproduce the, or, you know, I, Personally, I don't think we're near the, this limit yet uh, in, in our simulations. Um, but if you do it like a simple back of the hand calculation, uh, quantum mechanically, you can sort of say that, okay, if you were to generate one unit of angular momentum in this ring uh, for say a, a single atom even on the scale of you know, 10 to the minus 25 kilograms, take the rotation of the earth, take sort of a mid latitude uh, number, you get that the radius of the ring has to be about, um, you know, 10 to the minus three meters, which, you know, is pretty large for a quantum system, but this is sort of not too far away from some of the systems people are building with BECs these days. So it's sort of, I think, an order of magnitude off uh, in terms of maybe two um, for, for some of this, these sort of Bose-Einstein condensate ring systems that, that have been being built over the last, you know, decade or so. Um, so yeah, just to talk about, right, the, before I get into the equations themselves and what we're actually solving in the code, I just want to give a brief primer again on, uh, on inertial forces, essentially, if you're not familiar with them. So you, you're, you're naturally intuitively going to understand what inertial forces are, but this is what helps manifest um, this uh, Compton effect in, in the ring. Um, so when, you, when you're doing classical mechanics, you know, Newton's, Newton's mechanics, when, you know, you, you do have to modify, just like Einstein had to modify his equations to account for general relativity, I, you have to account for depending even in classical mechanics, you have to account for um, these um, sort of what they call inertial or fictitious forces that depend upon what sort of uh, in reference frame you are. So in this case, the train uh, the, uh, has a, you know, a string with a ball attached to it. The person standing on the tracks, on the side of the tracks, watching the train go by, basically just sees this ball pulled back at an angle um, as the train is accelerating in one direction and they see this sort of tension in the string, you know, 
um, being balanced by the gravitational pull of the earth on the ball. Now for the person who's accelerating with the train, this non-inertial reference frame, you know, they, 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 they can interpret this differently. They see, yes, there's a tension in the ball, there's the gravity, but it looks like there's this other force that's pulling the ball back away from them because essentially they're accelerating with the train, right? And this is, you can kind of think, right, okay, they're seeing the ball, but right when the observer on the train is accelerating with the train too, you know, they're feeling that um, sort of uh, inertial force as well, right? It's the same thing if you, you know, take off in your car and hit the accelerator too fast, right? You feel like you're being thrown back into your chair, right? It's the, it's the same, it's the same feeling. It feels pretty real, right? Um, but it's, you know, how you want to interpret that mathematically and, you know, philosophically, it's, 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 it's a matter of uh, opinion, I guess, in some sense. Um, but in addition to sort of that sort of linear sort of uh, accelerating fictitious or inertial force, in rotating reference frames, you have, you have other ones. So the centrifugal force, this is the one basically you feel when you're taking your car around an off-ramp and you're being sort of thrown outward um, uh, as you go around the curve. Um, there's the Coriolis effect, which I mentioned is sort of the one of the forces that should be uh, accounts for the, the the Compton generator effect. Or, uh, and you know this is also why you know this is the the force that is the uh, drives you know which way hurricanes or um, what's the what's the southern hemisphere version called? I forget. It's, um, but essentially, which way they they, they spin, whether in the northern and southern hemisphere. You know, same same thing where the uh, the, um, the the urban legend of which way the water goes down the toilet bowl. Um, this is sort of the the, the math behind it, uh, depending on which uh, hemisphere you're in. Um, and then one one that most people aren't familiar with is this Euler force I mentioned. Um, essentially, you can, this is uh, due to a change in the actual rotation of the system that you might be. Um, standing on. So if you're on the merry-go-round, this is kind of the force you feel when uh, you, the merry-go-round starts and then when the merry-go-round stops, right? As it's spinning up and it's slowing down, this is the, you're going to feel this Euler force. And this is also um, one of the forces and essentially the force that drives um, the system uh, in our simulations. And I'll show you how, how that works. Um, so you know, we're talking about this sort of classical um, case uh, of inertial forces and how you have to account for whether or not you're in uh, an inertial frame, a sort of a frame that's not accelerating or one that is accelerating. And a rotating reference frame is an accelerating reference frame. So we have to modify, just like we have to modify uh, Newton's equations, we also have to modify the Schrodinger equation, which is essentially the one we're solving. Um, all right, and so if you're not familiar with the Schrodinger equation, this is essentially describing the um, the state of a um, quantum mechanical particle. In this case, we'll talk about a single quantum mechanical particle. It's a complex valued function. Um, the two terms on the right hand side uh, they, that drive the the time dependence is are the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So the, 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 the ring-like system that we'll, be talk, that we'll be setting the particle up on will be determined by the, the potential energy in the system. Now, like I said, we have to modify this equation though for the rotating reference frame. And so you pick up this additional term that um, this is where all of the rotational inertial forces um, come into play. And essentially what it looks like you have this coupling between the angular momentum of the system and the rotation of the system itself. And so this is the extra term that we throw into um, our simulations to, um, to, to study the, the, these, pro these quantum problems in rotating reference frames, essentially. And you know, the, you know, so the initial angular momentum of the system matters, you know, how you vary the rotation is in the system's matter. Um, and that's sort of what drives a lot of the systems that we've looked at. So one last thing um, before I start getting the details of, of the simulations and how we do them um, is one of the things that we were looking for when we when we started this um, sort of um, doing some more uh, intense simulations that I'll show you uh, in the last few years is one thing about this, these quantum systems is the because they're um, 
they're, 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 if you think about the, the wave function is defining sort of the quantum fluid that determines the properties of the particle in the system, um, it's, it's more restricted than a classical fluid. And essentially the, it's, you, the, 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 the field that's defined by the particle, the, the, the density of, of the fluid, is, it has to be irrotational. And so any rotation that comes into the system really has to um, generate what we call quantized vortices. And essentially, you can kind of think of these as little quantized um, tornadoes of angular momentum in the system. And th these things are well known for you know, decades, essentially. Um, probably since the 1960s, I think, is when they first observed them in superfluid helium. But in the last you know, 20 years or so, um, uh, in Bose-Einstein condensates, there's lots of beautiful experiments that uh, have shown um, how these um, vortices are generated and sort of how they interact and how you can sort of manipulate them. And Rick, Rick has done a lot, of, uh, a lot of work on this kind of stuff um, over the years, looking at the dynamics and things like that. Um, but this is an important thing that we were looking for because essentially during my dissertation um, work, um, we didn't really have the compute resources to actually do full simulations and output the full wave function of the system. So all we had to go on were sort of uh, um, what we call the expectation value, sort of average values of say the angular momentum that was generated in the system over time as the simulation progressed. We didn't have a full picture. So uh, the new simulations I'll show you here um, we were really looking for, all right, do we see vortices generated in the system? Okay, yeah, we should, it should be obvious, but you know, we really wanted to get a picture of what was actually going on in the simulations we ran for my dissertation and sort of proceed from there, of like how, how we should go about thinking about analyzing the system further. So this is the code um, that was written, um, and it was essentially written specifically for this problem. Um, it's this problem of simulating the Compton generator. It was sort of the, the, the more difficult of any of the problems we were thinking of um, doing during my dissertation. Um, and at one point we sort of did, had, didn't have, I mean, we had uh, some, some code from some previous students that wasn't quite, um, you know, modifications of that code, the, 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 the methods weren't really working um, when you added in the full three-dimensional um, uh, coupling term between the rotation and the angular momentum in the system. It was kind of unstable with that method. And so this really had to be built from the ground up to um, solve this problem. And sort of that's sort of what my last year of my um, dissertation was essentially building up this code, getting as much data out of it as I could before I had to try to graduate. Um, so it's a Fortran code. It uses um, uh, sort of a generalized Runge-Kutta um, time integration scheme with central differences on a Cartesian grid. Um, it is a hybrid MPI, OpenMP code, um, essentially because the, the size of the problem gets pretty large, right? If you think about it, like, okay, we want to simulate um, sort of a ring-like system. It's kind of It'd be nice to do it on a like a polar grid, but that thing that gets complicated trying to implement the, um, the angular momentum operators and things like that. And it's not as general for other systems you might want to look at in the future. Um, so, you know, putting a ring system on a Cartesian grid, but then also remember there's supposed to be these quantized vortices, which are small, um, fine grained features on the system. So you have to have a pretty high. Um, uh, um, grid grid point density on 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 your on your um, on your simulation domain to resolve the dynamics of the any of these vortices that you might see generated. So you sort of have both. The problem is you have large scale structure and small scale structure that needs to um, be resolved, and it's you know the the problem sizes get pretty big. Some of these simulations are um, you know over the even outputting just you know some fraction of the full wave functions every so often, you know, run into the the terabytes of of of, of, of data. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, I'll probably skip over this stuff a little bit, so because we're um, we've got about twenty minutes left. But like I said, all these slides are here if you want to come back and look at them. But yeah, like I said, it's generalized fourth order Runge-Kutta time integration scheme. 
central differencing. This is the um, second order um, differencing sort of uh, uh, scheme in sort of a compact form. Um, for the uh, parallelization, um, you know, to keep things simple, I only did a sort of 1D slab domain decomposition. So essentially, um, uh, it's not, 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 not the best for scaling long term, but it was the simplest to implement where essentially you're going to break up your, you know, 3D volume in the Z direction and distribute those across, say, multiple nodes um, that you want to run the simulation on. And then there's a communication pattern scheme to pass around the boundary conditions between um, the different um, slab subdomains um, that um, takes care of all that. Uh, that's, I don't know if this is the, the best scheme, but it seemed like the most logical one and simple one to implement at the time. Um, so if you're curious about that, you can come back and look at this um, uh, diagram a little bit, bit better, uh, or a little bit longer. It probably takes a while to um, sort of sort out what's going on here. Um, you know, and, but for even with using that sort of simple slab um, 1D um, decomposition, um, you know, I was able to get some pretty decent scaling results for anything that, you know, I'd ever written before, you know, the, I think the peak sort of strong parallel scalability I got like on Comet, um, which in each only allows up to 1700 cores per job essentially. So I got it up, I ran up to 1152, I think, and got around a 300, um, 300 X um, speed up over a single core. It's not, you know, great efficiency, but it's, um, you know, if you want to um, run these large simulations, it's, you know, it's, it's helpful to get it, get it done faster. Um, uh, then, then, and then, then, you know, because essentially, you know, it won't fit on a single node. So, uh, in some cases, um, I did some studies of the weak parallel scalability, but this is something that needs to be looked at further. And if you haven't done this stuff with your own code before, um, you know, it, it's good to understand, especially if you're you're thinking ever applying for an exceed allocation. These are the kind of graphs and data that they want to see that you understand how your code runs, how scalable is it, how efficient is it. So when you request, oh, I need this many core hours, I'm going to use it this way. Does it make sense? You know, your arguments in, um, in sort of, you have to always uh, write about your code performance and scalability um, uh, section, essentially. So you have to sort of convince them you know how the, the code runs and that you're, the, the simulations you're proposing make sense um, just from a computational perspective. I'll probably skip over this stuff, but this is also good to do um, with any of your simulations. Verify, you know, the methods are working correctly and you're getting the right order of accuracy, spatial order of accuracy, temporal. Um, verify that the, you know, you have some analytic solutions if possible that your code is going to um, agree with. Um, this is kind of some, some of the studies we did there. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of uh, touching on the numerics. And so I kind of want to get into um, some of the results. So again, just to remind you, this is kind of uh, what we're looking for. We're looking for um, some, you know, drift velocity. So the, this quantum system on the right-hand side, there should be some rotation generated in this system um, after the ring is flipped, essentially, after this Compton flip. And what we did originally, like I said, is we only had measurements of essentially the, the angular momentum about the z-axis that was generated. And so that's sort of what the hint we were looking for when we first did these simulations, when we had no full um, view into what the wave function or the density of the system was, was doing. This is sort of the model potential for the ring that we have. I just call it a simple harmonic oscillator ring potential. It's pretty straightforward if you're curious what the ring potential looks like. Um, it essentially just has a sort of a sombrero, you know, sort of structure to it essentially. Now this is the one of the interesting things, you know, by implementing this code to do, um, in, in, you know, with a method that was stable enough um, to uh, do these full 3D rotational um, calculations, you know, there, there's two ways we could have gone with these simulations, right? So, I mean, you might have been thinking um, while I've been talking that, okay, they're going to rotate this potential end over end and watch this full ring rotate 
through the computational volume. No, that's going to cause that's going to be even um, more computational domain that you know you don't want to um, have to compute over um, to do these simulations. So what we actually do, because the code is sort of robust enough, what we actually do is rotate the reference frame itself. So essentially, in this graph, what I'm showing is the the angular moment or the angular uh, velocity of the rotating frame, right? We start off positive in Z, and then we, over time, flip it, you know, uh, to the negative direction. So essentially, we're rotating um, in a, a different reference frame than, say, the uh, the one where the the potential itself, the ring itself, would be rotating, right? So we're we're on the the frame where the ring is rotating end over end in the simulation. And what that allows us to do is to keep that vertical Z dimension of the computational domain smaller, right? So the, the, the simulation size that you have to, um, sort of the computational domain you have to compute over is much smaller. And so that's one way we save, um, save compute time and also, you know, output storage size and all this stuff uh, that, that, that also becomes a problem with these large simulations. And so these were the preliminary results that we got, um, you know, five years ago now, four, five years ago now, it seems like, I guess five years in December. Um, so this is just showing, so the, the, the key thing you want to look at here is the, the LZ, this yellow line, essentially. Um, the red and blue will get kind of um, crazy. It doesn't really mean much. Uh, um, you can ignore it for now. But essentially, there, I'm starting at some angular velocity of the ring. I go through the flip and you don't really see any angular momentum in the Z um, generated after the flip, right? So what we're looking for is um, a, a vertical change in that um, yellow, that yellow line to indicate the angular momentum, some rotation in the, in the wave function itself was generated. But if you spin up the angular velocity of the reference frame further, um, now you do see a change, right? So you start from a, a zero resting state of the, the quantum system, and there is some net overall average angular velocity generated in the Z direction, right? So this is essentially the, the, the result at the end of my dissertation, right? Um, we did a few other things like, okay, well, what if you start it, you know? What if you start with a rotating um, initial state how does that change after the flip, right? So again, in, at this rotation rate, you see a flip and there is definitely a change in the rotation of the system. And that, that's, that's really it. Um, the, the, the one thing that we knew back then was essentially the, the amount of change here um, doesn't correspond anywhere near what you would expect just from the back of the envelope calculation uh, that were in the earlier parts of my slides um, for the Compton generator basically. If you took the classical you know, equations and you know, did your sort of back of the envelope quantum calculation, it's sort of orders of magnitude off. So um, this is sort of the, the open question still that we're exploring. Um, right after I finished uh, my dissertation, this was um, sort of uh, the first visualization we had where, okay, yeah, maybe we're seeing the vortices generated. This was sort of a 2D projection. Uh, of the system, and I'll play a movie here. I don't know. Hopefully, it shows up well over uh, over Zoom. I don't know, but essentially, this is kind of a two D projection of the simulation itself. So, uh, in the um, this is uh, along the Z direction. So this you know, X and Y, you can see here the spatial coordinates here, and so you can see there's these sort of vortex looking like structures that show up. Um, that are generated, um, but the simulation is kind of a bit crazy. Uh, if you look at the um, X and Y, so you can kind of see, so this is looking now, actually the labels are uh, wrong here. This is like X and Z on the, the, the vertical axis. So you're looking sort of in the plane of the ring. And you can see that in the, these simulations, we had huge uh, vertical excitations, essentially, which is not really, um, probably what we want to really explore in this system, but this was kind of in, at least an indication of like, okay, there's a lot of the, the energy essentially that's generated in the system by the flip. 
is being put into um, these uh, vertical modes of, of the ring, essentially. So um, yeah, so while I was working at SDSC, um, I, I, I wrote up this um, exceed allocation uh, proposal with Rick, and we applied, got some time to essentially do, you know, use the compute resources on Exceed, you know, because they had storage space, they had the compute um, size to actually do sort of the full wave function simulations and then do visualizations to get a better idea of what's actually going on in, in this, this Compton generator system for the simulations that we had um, done previously and to explore the parameter space a little bit more. Um, I'll probably skip over this. Um, uh, this is just about the allocation, sort of the re compute resources we used uh, and storage numbers. So, um, like I said, it takes terabytes of, of, of data storage to store a couple simulations. So we had 13 terabytes of storage. Um, and so this is kind of what we got uh, in 2018, roughly. Some of these were the new results. And it was only really in the last year and a half that I was able to put this together and um, finish um, some of the visualizations. And so, again, I think this simulation is exactly the same one that uh, I showed where we had the early 2D visualization results, sort of with the projected plane simulation. So I'll kind of show you what this looks like now with a full 3D simulation that was done with the program called a uh, Paraview, essentially, if, if you haven't used it before. And so this is the simulation uh, now in a, with a, this sort of 3D. It's probably going to be a bit choppy over Zoom, but um, you can kind of see this is basically doing, um, there's sort of a density contour uh, visualization here. So this is only looking at the density of the wave function. So it's not running too smoothly for me, so it's probably not for you. but um, I'll just show you, this is, again, very similar to that 2D version uh, projected plane. This is one of the simulations that had these huge out of plane dynamics. So this is one of those ones looking down the plane of the simulation. You can see that there's large um, uh, vertical excitations in the system that we wanted to sort of damp out as we move forward. Um, and I'll skip over the... Uh, so, so as you can see, again, we know sort of where angular momentum is definitely being generated in the system uh, from just looking at the, uh, the angular momentum expectation values. Um, so this is here, I'm basically what I'm doing in these uh, results, you'll see at the bottom, there's this kappa Z value. This is the vertical um, uh, harmonic oscillator strength of the ring. So essentially, as I increase this value, what I'm doing is increasing the compression of the ring in the Z direction, trying to stamp out those vertical excitations and make sure more of whatever um, energy is dumped into the system is done so in, um, in, in the plane of the ring. So trying to sort of damp the, um, the, 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 the Z excitations and sort of only look at the, um, the, the rotational um, dynamics of the ring in the XY plane. Okay. So as I um, increase this value, the, the, the compression is going up. And one, one thing you can see in the, the, the compression essentially is, you'll see this in the LX and LY um, values, right? There's these huge out of plane dynamics. That's why these LX and LY values are kind of all over the place in these um, other simulations. But as you increase the compression in Z, they get stamped out, right? So this is kind of where we're at, where essentially 10 times the original strength in the Z direction where um, the original uh, sort of preliminary simulations were done. This is what the, um, the new ones look like, essentially. So you can, you can probably tell it's a little bit more pancakey looking here in this simulation. Um, And there's a lot more complicated structure now as well. So that's just paused on a image. And you can kind of see there's uh, these pockets of uh, low density and then higher density. And we'll look at that in a second. Uh, 
in another way. And so as I said, more pancakey. Um, so now we're looking at the plane of the ring and you can, you can see that those Z excitations are completely stamped out in the simulation. Right. And then now I'll go to basically the, the last result. So, but I need to stop here for a second. So in this simulation, I'm again, or in this visualization, I'm again plotting the density of the, the quantum system, which is the blue um, sort of contoured visualization, um, uh, color coded, uh, sort of like in the rainbow colors. Um, the, the next most important one is the phase. So this is looking at, right, the, the wave function is a complex value field, right? So you can compute the phase value between the real and imaginary. And this, um, with these quantized vortices, what you expect to see is a two pi sort of phase winding around the low density areas. So you should see a sort of sweep from, you know, black to white very sharply around these concentrated vortices. Okay, and I'll try to pause um, the, the simulation on, on, on one of those um, sort of frames. And then the, the, the reddish, orange, black, white um, is the, the velocity field, essentially. It's somewhat useful, but it's essentially, you know, there's a limited amount of resources even to do the visualization. So I sort of just um, created the visualization to have as much information as possible. So when we start looking at it, we can kind of understand a little bit better what was going on. So it's sort of on one side is the phase, um, visualization, the other side is velocity, and then the density is um, sort of overlain on top, um, as, as you'll see here. So I'll go ahead and start this up. So again, we flip the ring around uh, its axis, and you can definitely see that this ring is starting to rotate um, after the, uh, the Compton flip. And I'll stop it here. You can kind of see in some of these pockets here, you see those two pi phase windings from dark to light. And these are those vortices that are getting generated and enter into the system from the um, outside of the ring, essentially. Um, obviously, there's a lot more complicated density structure going on and um, what the velocity of this um, uh, of the rotation is in the ring now is it's a little bit complicated now because one of the problems that we ran into essentially by using only these sort of averaged expectation values is it's not you know there's no fundamental requirement that all of these angular all the the angular momentum carried into the system by these vortices are um, don't cancel each other out at some point too right so there could be some positive vortices and some negative vortices and the overall net angular momentum of the system is really distorted by you know where these vortices are and how many there are and which charge they have and you know there's a lot of complicated dynamics going on here that we're we're still sort of explore um, and that's sort of what the next phase of the project is essentially um, sort of over the last few months I've been coming up with some new code to essentially compute some other aspects of this. Um, measurements for the the rotation rates so essentially you can sort of compute a a, a a current of the quantum mechanical probability around the ring that's sort of some of the new code that's been implemented just before the pandemic hit essentially um, and you can also compute sort of uh, average velocities um, across different planes in the system is another thing i've implemented and essentially the next step is we're, we're really going to do a parameter sweep in um, both the ring size and the rotation rate again, because essentially we didn't really change the, 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 the size of the ring in the, these initial simulations. And that's sort of to get a better idea of like what the um, scaling is to the observed dynamics, we need to um, vary the, uh, the, the radius of the ring now, essentially. And that's um, pretty much it. So we're I'm sort of gearing up to do the, that parameter sweep now with the, the new code in place. And that's, um, kind of my talk. So I'll take any questions you guys have. I'll just want to put up the acknowledgments here and try to... Right. Thank you, Marty, uh, for uh, this uh, nice talk and overview. So I will uh, open the floor for uh, any questions for Marty. Um, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned uh, one of the 
current directions being, uh, or your list that you showed, I guess one slide before this. Yes. Um, or, no, me, no, it's right here. Drift velocity does not yet match classical. At some point you told us it was four orders of magnitude different than the classical. So how are you gonna get him to match? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, I think, I think, yeah, the estimate, it's, it's not like, it's not four orders of magnitude, it's more like, I think it was more like, you know, a factor of 20 or something, if I, if I recall the back of the envelope calculation. Um, I mean, it's still a lot, so, um, I mean, much further than I was expecting. But again, I think the problem is maybe, um, yeah, I mean, the, the expectation value should agree at some point, but there's all this complicated dynamics where there might be some cancellation going on with all these vortices. Maybe they're not all in the same direction. Um, it, it's hard to say um, right now. I, yeah, it, 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 at some level, it should match. But there's also the possibility, right? I mean, you know, there there is such a thing as, you know, well, you're in the quantum regime, it won't match. So um, I, this is why I sort of went down the road of um, recently implementing these other metrics of the rotation, right? By looking at the probability currents across different surfaces in the simulation, I should be able to compute what the classical version of that is and see how far that is away. and it, shouldn't be as I think affected by um, sort of the angular momentum carried in by the vortices, right? Because it's really looking at the mass, um, the, the mass current or the probability current um, moving across these surfaces. So um, that's sort of like the, the angle that I'm going in right now. Interesting, thank you. More questions for Marty. So Marty. Yeah. Andy. Mm -hmm. um, so I enjoyed that talk a lot. Um, I, I have the luxury of working with um, stationary states, you know, so time independent sure. uh, quantum mechanics. So do the stationary states provide the initial wave functions? Yeah, 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 essentially. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, essentially what we're doing is, um, you know, you, you, there's actually not, for, for this ring potential, there's not a, um, a, a known, analytic solution, I, I, I might have something close to one, but um, you can do a pretty good approximation. And then essentially we, um, uh, before starting the simulation, we run a, um, a uh, imaginary time propagation um, to get the ground state of the system. Or in the case of, you know, sometimes I, I showed that we start with a, a, a non-zero angular momentum. You know, you can actually still use imaginary time propagation to get, um, sort of that kind of excited state where basically the, the, the system will converge and even in the imaginary time propagation state to one with non-zero angular momentum. And I, I'm sorry I don't grasp the physics better, but do you have any conservation laws? I mean, I, I gather that the, the total angular momentum is not conserved in this, is that right? Is, is the energy conserved? Um, I mean, so you, I mean, there there are conservation laws for sure, um, and this is like one of the things. Obviously, we check in the code to make sure everything's working properly. Um, but essentially, yeah, I mean, this is a time dependent system where you're essentially putting energy into the system. So you'll see, I don't have any graphs here, but yeah, there's a certain energy to the system before the flip, and then there's a certain energy after the flip. So you can measure that change in energy that's generated, right? And there's a change, just like there's a change in the overall angular momentum in the system, you can see that in the, the plots I showed, there's also one for energy. So nothing is, um, I mean, um, you know, the, the, the probability, I mean, you know, the, the, the mass is conserved. <laughs> I guess that, that, that's, that's the one that's definitely conserved. Thanks. I want just to add, uh, because maybe the audience is not familiar with imaginary time integration, but uh, when you're talking about the nonlinear Schrodinger equation or the linear Schrodinger equation, if, uh, if you just, just change time to minus i times time, uh, the equation becomes a dissipative equation and it naturally actually tends to the, to the ground state. So that's what we use. So it's, it's a relaxation take method by uh, integrating in time. Yeah. Um, I wanted to um, ask you a, a question, Marty. Um, so 
you had the ring uh, that was pretty loose in the z direction and then you basically constrained the z direction to be a little bit uh, finer so to avoid sloshing in the z direction and nonetheless i still see that there is a lot of sloshing in the in plane direction so it's a lot of movement so in that case you are not really doing the Com compton case where you had really a really thin uh, ring so you have a lot of perturbations in the x y that um, are also affected. So first question is, um, you, you did recover more quantum flow after you shrunk in the Z direction, correct? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I, think, I think that's what's shown in the, um, um, so well, I think actually, actually, I'm, I mean, the, like I said, the it's the the looking at the z component of angular momentum. I think is a bit misleading. Um, I think I mean you probably don't remember this, but we talked about this when I think first um, did these uh, visualizations like a year or so ago, where we actually looked at the. I mean, it's not going to be easy to see over Zoom um, with the the lag and the, the 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 frames, the frame rate. But essentially, if you look at each of these simulations, we saw that the overall rotation of any of the disturbances, you know, around the ring, regardless of the Z um, excitations, looked about the same. So it's not like it was speeding up as you compress in Z. Um, so I, I think that maybe answers your question. Even Correct. Even, even, what would happen if you do compress the ring now? Uh, on the uh, x y so yeah. to avoid all this mess in the x y to try to uh, confine the movement to do the compton uh, yeah flow. yeah i mean that's that's sort of uh, part of the parameter sweep that i didn't put on the slide essentially yeah i mean i might i i, I probably i'm actually even going to start with i am a, 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 a 10 times compressed in the in our direction too any any other questions for Marty? Let me just add, add, add another one. Um, classically, the Compton generator does only depend on the initial angle and the final angle, provided you are in a stationary rotation, that the background rotation is stationary. Obviously, if the Earth start moving or whatever, it will matter how fast you do the the, the the turn but it just matters that you are a certain uh, at a certain angle and then you do the flip so the speed at which you make the flip how fast you flip it yeah. in the um classical case uh it doesn't matter how fast you do it right yeah i mean this is and you know where i'm going with that question uh I mean, I don't know exactly where you're going, but um, I mean, maybe, I mean, does it matter is what you're saying? Yeah, the formula that you show, the classical formula of Compton is just initial and, and final angle. It doesn't matter how fast you went there. It takes you a year to flip. And then after you flip, you have the same Compton uh, yeah. current that if you just flipped it almost instantaneously, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think if you go back to his papers, it was basically he was flipping it manually. So I'm guessing it was like maybe a second <laughs> and you can sort of the, the ring was like a meter across or something like that. And the size of the two. See, this is the thing. Yeah. In that classical case, the, the, the size of the ring versus the, the thickness of the ring is like a hundred fold. And that's not the case. In the <laughs> like the, the you know, it's like a meter versus like a, a centimeter. Or something like that. Or, so, uh, so that's basically what I'm going. If classically it does not matter how fast you do it, the problem is here you're doing it at a quantum level, and then you're defining you're, you're, you're basically resolving these quantum vortices, and you don't have sufficient number of vortices to average the angular momentum to be at the classical level. This is really at the quantum level. So in this case, the speed at which you're moving and you're doing the flip, it will matter because you have a lot of vortex interaction dynamics you do not have enough vortices to do an average at the classical level so here the speed at which you're doing is even going to matter because of this interaction between vortices at the level where we have a soup where you don't have enough beams to actually do an average 
Yeah, I mean, so it, we, I mean, we did look at different flip rates, um, and yeah, it does matter. So, um, yeah, the the faster the better is. I mean, in terms of, I think, uh, um, not not causing a mess. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, because like you can imagine, like if the flip rate is really slow, like well, it's just going to slosh all onto one side of the ring for a while. Right. So, so yeah, there, there is, there is some like uh, limit here that you should be above in terms of the rate of flip to sort of put towards the classical limit. And, and just on the historical side, uh, did Compton measure the rotation of the speed with his experiment with certain precision? How far, how, how close did he get? Uh, yeah, I forget what the precision was, but I mean, I don't, I mean, I think it was reasonable enough to like be uh, sensible. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't recall what the, the what the precision was, but it, I think it was like also just like an interesting experiment that an undergraduate did that no one ever thought, you know, of the idea. No, no, the the, the, the qualitative aspect is, is is big. You do it, and then you will see it, I and mean, you can do this with your students, and you will see the qualitative. I was talking more about the quantitative. Yeah, um, aspect of, of, of the result, but it was just uh, for, yeah. For the I mean, even for us, we haven't really thought about like you know, you know, is this a way to actually measure things more accurately? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just, I mean, we started this just because it was kind of an interesting problem. Like, huh? Well, can we do that? So, um, so and, maybe we have time for a final question, a magic man. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, I just wanted to continue the uh, tradition and uh, have a, uh, instead of going to Eureka 2, we can have our, uh, our virtual spike soda. <laughs> it is uh, Friday, right? <laughs> you don't, it's Friday, you don't have to drive. Why do you have to have uh, something so light? You need to have something much stronger, right? No, no driving required. Well, isn't the, the seltzers are in right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, it's it's good. <laughs> and I've got my little MG so I can drive it around the neighborhood, you know. But uh, we have, uh, Kurt and I are always uh, celebrating uh, the uh, colloquium uh, with FaceTime and stuff like that. And... Uh, uh, we're just always waiting for more people to show up on FaceTime. Okay, anyway. All right, so that, that's a call from the Magic Man. If you wanna stay, um, um, I have things to go, so I have to go, but uh, anybody that wants to stay and chit chat a little bit more, uh, you can stay. Uh, let me just finish by thanking again, uh, Marty, for taking the time to talk to us about what he has been up to in the next uh, last uh, few years. And just to stress the fact that Marty is a former student of ours, so it's nice to see our students uh, gaining some um, knowledge and accruing some knowledge that they can put out in the field. And now they are well versed into a, this HPC world and are helping and being part of grants and all that. So thank you, Marty, for being here and keep uh, keep on the the, the good work. Uh, I don't know, Jose Castillo, you wanna finish with something? Uh, I'm gonna say that uh, you you don't ask anybody who wants to stay this uh, how do you call it uh, the the thing we have to close down the the recording and so you can go somewhere else if you are but uh, i just want to thank uh, mari for the talk and everybody for attending so and uh, see you next time yeah if anybody has any questions feel free to contact me okay Thank you, guys. Bye, guys. Bye.